everyone, and welcome back to Cinematic Universe. My name is Ernesto Martinez. Joining me, as always, are the Robertsons and Benjamin Targaryen Kritzman. How are you guys? <laughs> great, great to be here. Good evening. I'm not as traumatized as I was a couple of days ago, but I'm still very excited to talk about this movie. All right. <laughs> Alien Covenant. The sequel to Prometheus, but... Because the executives did not want the movie to underperform, they decided to want the movie to be called Alien instead of just Covenant. So here we are. We have returning actor Michael Fassbender, and we have our new cast, Catherine Watterson, Billy Crudup, Danny McBride, Damian Bachir, Carmen Ijogo, Juicy Smollett, Kelly Hernandez, Amy Smits, Nat Nathaniel Dean, Alexander England, and all the delicious cannon fodder that keeps following this type of film. So, <laughs> I typically, well, not typically, typically would mean that I do it once in a while and every so often. I, for, for a few times before when a movie in a franchise were to come out, I would always ask some volunteers to help me, you know, review some movies that came before it in order to leading up, you know, to the new film's release. But because of work and scheduling and stuff like that, I haven't been able to do so, which is why I wasn't able to find, you know, time to do the original Alien and other movies like it, like the Aliens, uh, Alien 3, Alien Resurrection, and the AVP crossovers, and I won't... And I won't be doing the Pirates movie either because, again, my schedule is, you know, a pain in the ass lately. And that's due to work and the fact that I need to make money and live. Uh, Ernesto, we understand, man. We, <laughs> we back you, bra. And, <laughs> you do you. And, you know, typically I'm like, well, at least I can at least marathon the movies to, you know, get ready for it. But because I also had some TV shows that I wanted to get through, I could have marathon every single one. So I just watched Prometheus the night before. And That's what we did. I wanted to do that, but um, I think Netflix and YouTube got in the way, so it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to throw this out really quick on, you know, my thoughts on the Alien franchise versus uh, our new Alien Covenant film directed by Ridley Scott. Um, first time I ever witnessed anything from Alien was... Back when a little store called Blockbuster was still around. and that's, Now that's a name I haven't heard in a very long time. That, that, that was a poor quote of Ben, or yeah, ben Kenobi from A New Hope. That was, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, All right, Blockbuster, you were good to us. Yes, Blockbuster, you were so good to us. And this was before DVD started coming out. So this was when VHS... No yeah. VHS yeah. was still king. Oh, VHS. And I actually used to argue PS was by far better than DVDs, and DVDs will never last. I was like in sixth grade, and I was like, man, clearly <laughs> though, it was better. I mean, you could skip freaking chapters. You can't do that on a VHS. I mean, you know, no. I was just nostalgic. Couldn't let it go. Couldn't change with the times, man. Yeah, so I couldn't, I can't exactly remember what I was doing at Blockbuster, that day, but I was either with my mom or my dad, and while they were off doing one thing, I went off to explore the, you know, the store. I was going to the action section, the drama section, the kids section, yada, 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 and then I went to the section that I always avoided because there was nothing there for me to see, and that was the horror section. <laughs> the best thing in the section, shit! And then I saw the covers for the original Halloween movie. I saw the covers for the original Friday the 13th movie. I saw the covers for the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Yada, yada, oh, yeah. yada. And then I came across this cover that I had no idea what I was looking at. I couldn't comprehend what the hell I was looking at. My feeble little childish <laughs> mind could not comprehend what it was. All I was seeing was something that looked like an egg. It had green ooze on it. It said alien, and for the life of me, my mind told me to stay the fuck away from it. <laughs> you knew. And deep in your subconscious, you knew. Fast forward a few years later, where DVDs are now in, we still have VHS at home. We have the DVD slash VHS boxes, you know, the dual type thing. Oh, yeah. 
and I'm finally allowed to watch R-rated movies in the household. In the, oh boy! In the household. Granted, Alien was not the first R-rated movie I saw. That's a story for another day. But we did have the Alien movie in there, in that little stash of VHSs that my dad had, which is where I discovered Jurassic Park, and I am the man I am today. So I popped in the Alien movie, and I just sat there in the dark, as you do. Oh, of course. Uh. Nobody else with me, just me and myself. I'm sitting uh, there. Right? It's got to be just the scariest situation possible for a child when watching <laughs> a scary movie. Yeah. The only thing that would be scary is raging on outside. Nah. <laughs> the, her- the king came a month after, trust me. Oh, well, that works too. I, yeah, that's what you get for living in the Caribbean. So, <laughs> there I am. The movie is starting. I have no fucking clue who these people are. But it is my introduction to it's my introduction to pretty much most of them. Sigourney Weaver, um, uh, Josh was it Josh Hurt or William Hurt? I was confused. Oh, John. John Hurt. John, yeah, John Hurt. Hurt. John Hurt. John. And uh, Bill uh, Bilbo, uh, that guy. The, oh, uh, Ian Holmes. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> yeah, Ian Holmes. Ian Anna. Holmes. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, that guy. Yeah. They were my introduction, and from there on, I discovered what Alien was, I discovered who Ridley Scott was, and, you know, here we are today, 2017, we have Alien Covenant, following the events of Prometheus, although we don't get to see what happened immediately after the ending of Prometheus, we do catch up with a new space colony on a ship boarded, that's the movie's title, The Covenant, and they're on their way to a planet light years away so they can start, you know, uh, colonizing it with 2,000 colonies and over several hundred, if not thousands, of embryos ready to, you know, grow to, for, you know, more colonies and more, uh, you know, subset of humans to, you know, either do working or science or just live, procreate, whatever have you. And they receive a distress signal. A very familiar distress signal. If you've already seen the movie, then you know what we're talking about. And full disclosure, we're going to go into spoilers, so don't worry about um, us keeping everything under wraps. We're going to just go for it straight away. Excellent. They they decide to check it out. They arrive on a planet that is, you know, very suitable to their needs. They figure, oh, well, we found this planet. Let's just mine it and forget about traveling the extra seven years. And then the shit hits the fan. Hijinks ensues. And the one thing I will—they literally s- step in it. Yeah, they literally step in it. The one That's thing I true. will say between the original Alien, the Aliens, and the third one, it gets a lot of bad rep, but I still like the third one for what it tried to accomplish. And our new movies here is that whereas the original Alien and Aliens and the third one were exploring the metaphor of, you know. STDs or HIVs or whatever you want to call it, and uh, rape culture because, you know, you have a, a foreign object trying to force itself on you and plant its seed inside you without your consent. We've, oh, yeah. We've haven't, we haven't abandoned it, but we've now jumped into the next metaphorical stage, which is pretty much creationism and God complexes. And it continues here, oh, heavily. And... <laughs> It's a movie that features one of the some of the best acting that Michael Fassbender has done in his career. Oh man, that dude! Absolutely, Jesus, what can he not do? Honestly, yeah, and features that really Scott is still the master of his domain. Oh yeah, I, I, what's kind of interesting to me was uh, when Prometheus came out in 2012. I was at a very much a crossroads with Ridley Scott. I'm a, a enormous fan. Of his early films, I love the Duelist, Alien, Blade Runner. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of Legend as well. And after that, there's a period where I'm sort of back and forth with his films. I, I like Gladiator. I like Matchstick Men. I like uh, Hannibal. I thought that was a pretty cool film. I, I really enjoyed Black Rain. And then there was ones like American Gangster that left me really cold. Um, there would be films where it felt like he tried too hard to maybe appeal to 
you know, to the foreign press or trying to get Academy Award consideration. And then Prometheus was sort of like this jump back into the director that he initially was, which was a guy who gave an almost Stanley Kubrick like gaze on otherwise B movie material. And Alien, it's often forgot that Alien is very much a, a very basic horror movie and a very basic monster movie. Planet of the Vampires. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it literally is two B movies spliced together. Mario Bob is Planet of the Vampires, and also a film called It the Terror from Beyond Space. Um, in Planet of the Vampires, you, it's literally a movie about a distress signal on another world where they go and find a dead alien that was inhabited by a parasite. And then uh, at the Terror from Beyond Space is basically about truckers in space who have a creature in their spaceship that they blow out of the airlock. That's so funny. People bitch about uh, Avatar being like, that's Pocahontas. It's like, well, that's generally so. But but yet a movie like Alien, which is, I mean, who doesn't like Alien? You know, I mean, it's it's beloved by all. I, I don't have ever seen someone argue against Alien, yet it's, Clearly mimicked from two other films, pretty directly. Oh, and even to the point too, where Ridley Scott descript, well, because the script itself is written by Dan O'Bannon, who I'm sure took from those films, and then Ridley Scott added his touch. He when he made Alien, he was like, "I wanted to make a movie that's 2001 meets Texas Chainsaw Massacre." And when he did Prometheus, I think a lot of people expected that again, and he went in an incredibly different direction, making an almost surrealist film and fresh in the you disguise know. of a blockbuster and now with alien covenant he's done something completely different it, all of a sudden it's he's created like this sort of sci-fi adventure film that's also heavily a horror film more so than prometheus more so than prometheus even like directly a horror film and uh it really em- embraces the monster moviness of the franchise People were scared. We saw it again today, and the audience was even more reactive than when we saw it in IMAX. There was actually, I guess, probably more people mm-hmm. at this viewing. But, I mean, people during the film were clearly distressed and were holding their breath and, you know, had these cathartic moments when it cut away from the violence. I mean, people were clearly having some strong reactions. I mean, it felt like, like last year The Witch was the only other horror film that we saw that elicited some of those same reactions, but the violence is so intense and the suspense is so intense. Not to say that it isn't the witch, but they're two completely different films in the way that the horror, you know, kind of is doled out. So, I mean, it was a very responsive audience for sure. That horror element was so strong. Well, this. it appealed to the, the blockbuster expectation. Well, or more so I would say the B movie expectations. Alien Covenant plays very much like a B movie. And there's elements of it that are surprisingly quaint and old fashioned. And it but it's cool because Ridley Scott really has a lot of ideas that he wants to throw out. And and that's a lot of youthful energy in it. Um he he has these big ideas and he's And you questions. said he's eighty, right? He's eighty. I cannot yeah. believe that. What? Yeah, right? Yeah, it's like really? And so really it's it's pretty fascinating because now he's made he's made three films in this franchise and they're pretty distinctly different all of a sudden what he's done is i think he's made the alien or the xenomorph monster um even more iconic by showing a certain flexibility with the mythology has a shin gojira element where it can just change into so many different things you know or like the thing we were talking about earlier how the thing can turn into even more than that what he's done for himself is is he's done something comparable to what George Miller has done with Mad Max, where George Miller has made four Mad Max films that are incredibly different. You know, it's, it's a, it's a riff on a theme where you don't necessarily make vastly different films. There are even sequels to each other, but they're almost different films in their own right. Or what George Romero did with night of the living dead and dawn of the dead where there's sequels, but they're almost different films in their entirety. Um, each one sort of a different style and unique to its own. Absolutely. And Scott has now done that with the three films he's directed in this franchise. He, this is a incredibly different movie mm-hmm. compared to Prometheus. Which it, is impressive considering it's a direct sequel to it. 
Oh, yeah, very much. You know, the Mad Max is at least kind of loosely tied together, and, you know, there's some different theories about it. This is direct continuation from the previous film. Yeah, but, yeah, but boldly different yeah. in tone. It, it really is. And what the, the thing that sticks out to me most, I told Nadia this yesterday, is this is the best setup, I think, I've seen in a long time for this kind of film because Scott gives you the situation where these couples and these people are literally going, they're leaving their world to start anew. So they're, they're doing this great sort of humanitarian act in essence. Nobody's escaping anything. They're doing something for the betterment of mankind. So your Delta card of character our Delta group of characters that are, you you instantly know that they are, Good people. Compassionate, kind people. That they believe in kindness and empathy and taking care of their fellow man. And so it's it's an incredibly different setup than the sexual politics of the first film. Well, they're just crew members on a cargo ship. Right. they're, They're not husbands and wives like in Covenant. They're not looking to be neighbors to build a paradise with each other eventually. I mean, they're just co-workers and... Well, every other film in the franchise has had a sort of confrontational relationship at its core between right. its crew. Either, you know, the the industrial element that's in all of the films or whatever. But in this against in- Whale and co- you know company, right? In this instance, everybody's sort of on board. Everybody's trying to take care of each other. There's not like a malicious person in this crew, and so the horror that Scott is able to create is even in a world where we're good to each other and kind to each other, we're not even safe. Well, and and, and, like David, he's the wrong note, the one wrong note in the symphony that eventually just, you know, destroys the whole thing. Right. Benjamin? Well, I was definitely right at the top by saying that this was going to be fun. (laughs) Because I'm sitting here listening to all of this, I'm like, okay, I didn't think of that, 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 or that, or that, or that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, the only thought in my head right now is, like, similar to what Ernesto did, in that, uh, like, when he was uh, taking us down his memory lane, I was like thinking to myself, okay, when was the very first time I was exposed to the Alien franchise? Was it Aliens? Was it Resurrection? Was it the first one? When, what was it? When did it happen? And at first I thought it was Aliens, but then I remembered years before that, many years maybe, um, back when my mother and I lived with... Uh, her parents, my grandparents, up here in Michigan, when we had just moved from Mississippi, I think it was uh, one afternoon, maybe late afternoon. I don't think it was night. It certainly wasn't pitch black, all the lights off like Ernesto had it. But I remember I was bored, as you are when you're a young boy with nothing to do. I was flipping through the TV trying to find something on, trying probably to look for some form of cartoon to amuse myself. It's called porn, Benjamin. Shut up. <laughs> not what I was going for. When I I come across this oh, this movie called Alien, and it's not, not at the beginning, it's not at the end. It's at this scene when this, the group of people, who I had no idea who they are, were all gathered around a dinner table. I'm like, okay, oh, this God. seems... Really? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you here. I'm like, 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 this seems... This seems all right. Let's see where this goes. Like yeah. talking, this, you know. And then all of a sudden, um, who, like, who's, who's the guy who gets the face hug right? I haven't seen the first one in a while. John Is it? Hurt. Yeah, John. Okay, Hurt. John Hurt. And then John Hurt starts to cough, and that progresses and snowballs until he's writhing and convulsing on the table. People are trying to restrain him, and all of a sudden, his chest erupts, and I. Th- I think it was about that time. Like, okay, I'm turning this off and I'm not sleeping at all tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so then fast forward however many years until we get to today. Or rather, um, let's say, I'm trying to decide if I want to pick the night of um, me seeing Covenant or the, yeah, 
you know, I'll just go with that. Fast forward to the night of me and my, uh, well, for lack of a better term, brother from another mother, someone who I grew up with after we moved here, um, and a couple of his friends, mutual acquaintances for myself, going to see Covenant opening night to celebrate, uh, I guess, him going off to the Army. I'm incredibly excited. Uh, I've been looking forward to it for days. He has been looking forward to it for days, and I think I find out on the way there that neither of the two friends that are going with us have seen any Alien movies at all. How? I I have no... uh, I I, I was going to say I have no idea, but that is not entirely true. It's due to the... To where they live and how they're raised, I'm guessing their parents are very uh, protective, if you want to put it nicely. Um, but my immediate reaction was, oh, <laughs> you two are going to have a very interesting time. That would I'm be excited. weird if they even know the context, because it's so heavily tied with, you know, Prometheus. I, well, I don't think they did beforehand. I, I, I did my best to try and explain things. Enough you need a full idiot's guide to <laughs> aliens. Much. Essentially, yeah. Um, trying to recall all of the details from all the pe- previous movies, only one or two of which I had seen somewhat recently. Those being, I think, Prometheus and Aliens. Uh, one, three, and four I hadn't seen in however long. But that's all beside the point. Um, I loved this movie from start to finish something that i've started to do with certain movies is i will watch the very first trailer or teaser and then do my best to not watch anything after that yeah it's tough it's all out there it's hard to yeah it, (laughs) it wasn't easy i mean i i remember doing it i think the very first movie was uh let like was Gareth Edwards' Godzilla way back when that came out. I vividly remember watching TV one night and there being a, a 30 second commercial for that. I immediately, not like the, the stereotypical saying, avert your eyes. That is exactly what I did. I like looked in a random direction, closed my eyes, and I pressed the fast forward. But I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I want to see this in the theater. <laughs> And it's, that's happened with a handful of movies. I did it again with this one because of the, all of the love that I have for this series, despite uh, the the still lingering bad tastes in my mouth from uh, 3 and 4, and more or less uh-huh. the AVP series. They have their good qualities. I'm sure I need to go back and watch them all again. Oh, yes, yes. you do. I, I, yes, I had intended do. to do that with uh, with this, kind of like what Ernesto said at the very beginning, like rewatching the whole series, but that did not happen. But So I only watched the very first trailer, or teaser, I think, for... Interesting, at, so you didn't for, watch any of the other online promos? Because there's actually, like Prometheus... The campaign for these two films have a lot of stuff that's part heavily part of the story, but it's not actually in any, any of the trailers or in the films themselves. But they are referenced in the films, especially this one reference. Well, it kind of relies on you to almost have some pre-background about the crew members. There's a whole, like, five-minute-long segment of, remember the picture that she's looking at, and it's all of them at the table at the end? That's right. Okay. Yeah, there's a five-minute right. photo right. of them that's all around right. that table, and you see actually see James Franco, and he's in the scene, and he's talking, and they're all <laughs> talking. You it's see, glorified cameo. <laughs> I know. I just this realized. Is, it's like, oh, oh, okay, oh, all right, well, he's out. Well, okay, so that that is a good point. I I had misspoke. Um, so, I don't know, very first teaser, and then the whole, um, what was it, like, five-minute-long um, short movie, if you want to call it that, when they're, like, going over, like, all the couples and everything. So I'd, I'd seen a little bit more. But I, I, I knew that there were going to be references to Prometheus, but I was not expecting it to be the sequel that it was and for it to go where it went like this 
I feel like if I had seen the movie with Ben and Nadia, I would have been one of the other people, like, audibly, like physically reacting and audibly reacting to what was <laughs> happening on screen. Because that's exactly what happened the first time I saw it, uh, mm-hmm. Friday night. And I, I would have seen it again. I've said this to everybody that's asked that I would have jumped at the chance to see it again if it wasn't so far away from where I am. The closest theater that has it is like roughly 40 to 45 minutes away. Ooh, and again, uh, I think it would I think it would have been worth the drive just for those like two over two hours of experience. But there uh, yeah, there were there were times where I audibly gasped where I I mean, I, I mean, this is a given. I sat forward in my chair numerous times. At what oh was yeah! Happening. And this is like this is one thing that I don't think any movie before Covenant has managed to do. Where like I, more or less, for lack of a better term, I would like I flailed my arms a few times. Like I would I like like put them like on top of my head on the back of my head like oh no no what do you why why are you doing this what are you doing <laughs> yeah there's a lot of gruesome stuff you know yeah that that reminds me of the like the f- opening 30 seconds of that initial teaser you see um what's her name the the p- in the shower the, i don't want to say the jump ship pilot no no um oh when they're trapped well, the, the she's trapped that, in the room yeah yeah, the well, surveyor, them, whatever, who was yeah, collecting yeah, the sample. Yeah, Ferris, I believe. Well, Ferris That's is it. Tennessee's wife. Tennessee's right? wife, and then there's yeah. Ferris. And then there, I can't remember, the, the woman Kareen? that was... Kareen? Yeah, who was trapped in yeah, the... Kareen, I believe. Mm-hmm. The yeah, was Ferris, Kareen, and then, uh, I guess, let's say red shirt number one, for lack of a better name. <laughs> that, that, like, I, I don't know, I wasn't like that opening for a teaser of all things, but that, that whole sequence had me hooked almost immediately just from the, like the, the quick flash of, uh, Ferris's perspective, looking in at the <laughs> poor schmuck that had the misfortune of being the red shirt. Number one, like I, like before this movie, I was used to the stereotypical quote unquote alien experience of, you know, face hugger goes on the face chest burst that comes out of the chest there's an order of operations here exactly exactly and then when it flashes to him convulsing on the table and his back erupting like what are you doing what is happening why are you going to black i want more it's the opposite of a chest burster it's a back burster Uh uh-huh Mm-hmm. so soon as i saw that teaser and i watched it again a few times today i love the music that was used in it i was all in, all the way, and I love this movie. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it as soon as I as soon as it comes out. I'll probably go the the distance, drive that 45 minutes to Best Buy to get the Steelbook. It was just that good. Yeah, I think it had a lot to offer. It's it's a really unique film because it's Ridley Scott taking the opportunity to really sort of define the iconography of this creature that he introduced. Um, and of course it's designed by, uh, the late HR Giger. It, it shows that the, the series has such a flexibility when you wouldn't, it's really not like this incredibly emotive monster. You know, the xenomorph is pretty much soulless and, and, uh, very, very insect like it, it, it just doesn't, it's not like it's King not a critter Kong or Godzilla or, or, or Dracula. Yeah, it's not anything that you can identify with. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a Nosferatu, like you've said before. Right. Well, what I remember Werner Herzog described the uh, the nineteen twenty two Nosferatu as being like an insect. It's like a vampire that you don't really sympathize with because it's so representative of an idea more than it even is like a character. And then that's sort of the case with the xenomorph. Is it serves as a uh, in the alien mythologies? It serves as a backdrop to show the cold indifference of, of the natural world, I, or at least that's Ridley Scott's perspective, apparently. Because no, that's what not he's David's, because he seems he's trying to bond with it very directly, like create a relationship. Oh no, 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 no! Yeah, that it's... little uh, chest burster was almost like a little baby Groot, you know, like spreading its hands and stuff. Yeah. But it yeah. was okay. 
the I, cutest I mean, moment I, ever in the Alien franchise. I want to put a pin in that. I want answers on how that was a little tiny xenomorph. Why was that not a chest burster? What did he do to make it a baby Groot? I've never seen that before. How did you do this? Um, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about is, is Scott is showing these in the film, in the, the screenwriters and Scott have made the decision to, to really show these ideas in a different fashion or an accelerated fashion or to have sort of a loose, um, period of evolution with this creature or how these creatures show up. And so it's, it's interesting to think about at what point in this evolution are we seeing how much of a setup is this for the, I mean, what has Scott said that he's going to make like another two or three of these or something like that? I think so, so. Yeah, it's interesting to see where this is all going. Like, are we getting pieces of a puzzle or, or what do we make of what we've seen? It's it's very unusual stuff. I'm honestly hoping it's pieces of a, of a puzzle because at the end of it, uh, as my, myself and the group that I was with were leaving – and we're trying to figure out where we, we were going to eat because we were all starving. The one thing I kept going back to was, okay, but well, what about LV426? How does it go from here to there? I was I was waiting for the reveal. At, an, at this time, I had temporarily forgotten that he was going to do another two movies at least for David to correct the computer say like we're no we're we're going to lv426 or like name drop that but that didn't happen so i i I want i want the rest of the rest of the puzzle here i want to know how that engineer ship is loaded with the eggs how that happened i want more of it (laughs) yeah we're wondering that too like how many planets have xenomorphs on them now i mean there's the one that came out of the giant octopus thing in Prometheus I mean theoretically that's still on that planet so that's one and we don't know if they're you know if if they can procreate if there's just one of them um you know and then other than that there's well I guess they all died on paradise planet did that there's no living ones on that one is there well, there's the other eggs, but no, no other people right. attached to. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's put it this way, and I'm going to reference this because it pretty much ties into that question. Uh, John he posted an article about you know what Alien Covenant did that the original did and stuff like that. I'm not gonna get into the whole thing of what that article was trying to get. It was pretty much an opinion piece, but if it's one thing that it brought up that it's pretty much true to this franchise is that. It's always going to have more questions than answers. It's always going to have a lingering mystery. If we've never had Prometheus or Covenant, and we've just had Alien and Aliens, we'd still be asking today where the hell did that they come from, what created it, or what was that ship, what was that thing that they found that had his chest bursted, etc., etc. And in this case, where Prometheus comes in to try you know, build a new mythology to tie in with the Xenomorphs and where the Xenomorphs came from, even when we had Prometheus, we were still asking questions like, okay, but this still doesn't answer LV, you know, the original planet, and it still doesn't answer how we go from here to Ripley. Then we have Covenant, and it gives us a little bit more answers, but we still haven't reached the... Uh, timeline of the original Alien movie, and we still have more questions than we do answers. So, we might keep going until we arrive to uh, the Nostradamus, but we still might be in a situation where we're just like, well, it's, maybe it's open to interpretation what happens or doesn't happen. Well, and plus, do you really want a movie that gives you all the answers? I mean, is that really the better film? I was just thinking about that, actually. Yeah, like it, all of that brought the the phrase like don't meet your heroes because like well that might not be the correct thing to say but um I, like while one part of me like ravenously wants the answers to those questions the other part of me doesn't because what if we get those answers and they're not as good as i or we or whomever thought they would be what if what was in our imaginations was better to us than what we ended up getting Yeah, it's like looking at a Picasso painting and being like, what were you thinking when you made all of these faces have this shape? And what if he was just, you know, what's the social commentary and the religious beliefs? And he's like, oh, I was just wasted, man. It's like, uh, uh. And there's a certain magic uh, with, 
monsters uh, with great movie monsters where you can have a flexibility to really spark the imagination and to be scary on a variety of levels. And what really Scott does so well is that you see the xenomorph and it's grounded very much in a scientific reality within the context of the film, but there's also an almost satanic dark imagery to it, that it looks like this thing from the abyss of hell. And so it, it's a very, very delicate balance that he's made where, you know, it began with the first alien, a film that's very much both a science fiction movie and very much a full blooded horror film. And alien covenant's very much the same. It has elements of very classic science fiction and it has very pulpy, gothic horror elements to it as well which is, is fascinating you wouldn't really think of that but the the combination of sort of religious imagery uh gothic imagery but also very sexual uh, imagery as well i think really sort of makes this series work it, it, it's it's uh it's almost like a farming ground for ideas and themes that any given director wants to explore. And I think that's what's been so flexible. James Cameron made a James Cameron movie with aliens and Jean-Pierre Genet to a large degree made a Jean-Pierre Genet alien film with resurrection. Yes. You can't Uh, hate on it for what it is, you know? Absolutely. And it's, and then I think the, the case of Prometheus alien and now uh, alien covenant, Ridley Scott has stepped up and done three very interesting variations on this genre. And I, I read an interesting article on RogerEbert.com that pointed out that in a lot of ways, Alien Covenant is sort of a composite of everything that Ridley Scott's ever done in his career. It has the sort of philosophical stuff concerning androids and their place in the world, very much like Blade Runner. Um, it has the biblical imagery in the vein of Kingdom of Heaven and Exodus. and He explores a lot of the things that he had touched an alien it embraces the sort of grand gluminal over-the-top gore of hannibal it, it just really has a lot of different ridley scott qualities in this film and then he also it's a really, good way to culminate the career his career yeah and also it really embraces aliens i mean there's very much a, a ripley hicks element a more plutonic version of it with with Tennessee and Daniels, it's like a companion. Yeah, and Walter certainly and has a, a right, and Walter certainly has a, a bishop esque quality. Mm-hmm. Well, it's and, also just the kick ass action scenes in it. Yeah, the, yeah, and the emphasis on action sequences. It's interesting too that Alien Covenant is very much a practice intention where Scott more or less sets up a series of set pieces focused around the story, and it really goes from sort of one tenth set piece to the next tenth set piece. And uh, there's not a lot of in between stuff. It's deliberate right. and it's And that's the advantage of the thing. series is it doesn't it's not really filled with exposition. It's filled with ideas and you get answers for some and you know, as Ernesto was saying before, and, and no answers for others. And um it, but it gives the series a greater strength because it, it really can be anything. This movie blew me away in that it, it gives you a new locale, it gives you new types of characters, it gives you new creatures, almost assuming that it's like, well, why wouldn't there be other species in this alien world? And then what Michael Fassbender does here and how he approaches playing, you know, what a machine is and what it's capable of and what really separates it from having a soul and not having a soul and again, sort of having its own divine insanity it's it's a really fascinating i mean it's it's complex there's a lot going on yeah it was actually much more complex the more we thought about it the initial viewing i was just thoroughly pleased with it as a b monster movie where i thought ridley scott had sort of added some sophisticated ideas to a very gory it just had that horror element so much played out and it definitely seemed to embrace the kind of film that was inspired by alien like you know, in the 1980s and 90s, where, you know, and Scott was like, all right, well, I can one-up that. I can make something just as scary and gory. But instead, there's a lot of Prometheus's big ideas. It's just very different takes on those big ideas. And the film has a much more action element. 
it, in a lot of ways, it is the aliens to Prometheus. Definitely, alien. definitely. It's far it has more that same progression. Yeah, it's far more action packed in a Ridley Scott kind of way, though. So I would say, you know, Prometheus and Covenant are certainly more philosophical series to me than Alien and Aliens are. Well, certainly. It brings up a lot of the same science, questioning the moralities of science, things like that. Right. Um, But in terms of just greater questions, you know, these existential questions through David's existence and him coming to terms with even what his desires and beliefs are versus the crew trying to go out and discover who made us Mm -hmm. and everything with whale incorporation. I mean, a lot of those themes are in alien and aliens, but this certainly opens up the real big questions. Well, I think too is the best way to look at the series is probably not alien and Prometheus, but there's the series that focuses on Ellen Ripley. And then there's the series that is the three films Ridley Scott himself has directed. Mm. And, You look at it in that context, Alien and Prometheus are very much, you know, sibling films. And both are siblings to to Covenant. And I think that's, I think that's really cool that you get that sort of variety and abstraction. And there's a very otherworldly horror to it. Like, it's scary. And you're saying strong female leads who are not Ripley part two and three. They certainly yeah. share a lot of the same characteristics that make them strong leaders in right. these groups. All um, three have a female lead. Yeah, but they're very different, totally different people. Characters. Very different. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and their crew are different characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, different dynamics. Absolutely. Absolutely. Billy Crudup and Danny McBride, I thought, were both excellent. Oh, my boy, Danny McBride. I'm so proud of him. I mean, he's just so legit emotionally, and everything he does has such resonance that really makes you relate to his character. So that's how he gets away with doing stuff that otherwise could have been totally dumbass shit. And the way it is, like, Flip This Way is fucking dumb as hell in the most the bestest way possible. Mm-hmm. It's comedic genius, you know, that mm-hmm. is carried through by that emotional resonance. And that's why when he does more serious films like this, I mean, when we, Ben, when you told me that Danny McBride was in a Ridley Scott film, I was like, what? Is yeah, that, is that legit? But it works really well. Oh, it's so good. In a way, um, he's a more emotionally complex and relatable kind of variation of the characters that Scott had in Alien. He would be kind of in that group of the Yafet Kodo or Harry Dean Stanton character, uh, the, you know, the kind of blue-collar guy on a spaceship. But everyone in Alien's kind of a hard well, Yeah, they're hard a hard-ass. Ass, you know? Yeah, they're a hard-ass. They're, they're, kind, of, is they're yeah, kind of mercenary-like. Yeah, Absolutely. With, without the mil- you know, the And again, that's the advantage to, to the setup. You're given the setup where these people are literally giving their lives to the possibility of setting up a new colony somewhere. So you're almost built the assumption that all of these characters are good people. And they, obviously there's a lot of love there because each one has a spouse. So the they decisions spouse, they make right. will be not only thinking of the 2000 colonists and thousand something embryos that they've vowed to protect and proliferate, but also to each other, not as a community, but then also to each other as husband and wife. Right. Or, you know, a couple. Well, and I think Scott's theme that he sort of approached in these last two films is the folly in Prometheus is that we're arrogant in our pursuit of knowledge and that on one hand, we have the right to know all that we can achieve. You know, all knowledge that we can obtain one way or another, we we should have a right to, but then at the end of the day, that knowledge can destroy us. And in this instance, you know, you know, sort of the futility of, of goodness and, and, and compassion. Which makes it a true horror film. Exactly. These people, sadly, get in bad situations trying to help other people. But then what do you do? But not what help? do you do? That's You're not supposed to help other people. When, it's a scary, it's a scary, scary thing. Tennessee had to make the decision to potentially right. wreck not only their lives and the ship, but then the only true way that they could right. get off that planet, the main it, ship. And it's this sort of duplicity to, to each theme and each quality of the film where, and again, it's, it goes back to the alien. The alien is the, is this monstrous thing, but it's not a monster. It's an animal. It, it's, it's right. It, I mean, it, yeah, the queen cares for its children. It gets right. emotionally enraged, kind of like the Muto when they kill the Muto's Godzilla, eggs. Yeah. 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 And, and Godzilla mm-hmm. 14, you know, they're just animals. They've given birth. Right. They have, 
mates. They have a, a society the way that, because the other xenomorphs clearly serve the queen and they obey right, her command. Right. There's a chain of, of natural order to their sp- perspective, and you can't hate on something for just being well, it, itself. Well, in a way, too, there's an even, um, an even more unique element um, added to that with the notion that if David created them, they never they never asked to exist. The sort of classic Frankenstein mm-hmm. or Dr. Moreau quality, which this film very much has. That it, It's very cool that you have this setup where these people end up in this supposed paradise and then this reclusive figure saves them and he ends up being um, manipulative and destructive and, and duplicitous and it's fascinating that Scott incorporates such an old fashioned sci it almost seems like a sci fi pulp story from the thirties or forties in a way that it's so simple. But then it's up the ante with the gore and then the religious themes that he's become very fascinated with. And and then the way the film uses the biblical imagery is, is absolutely oh, incredible. Yeah. Like it and almost Snyder looks, just ooh, they're strong right. in the biblical stuff. All right. And, and well, this, Kubrick too. I mean, who? Well, yeah. Scott, as you said. Yeah, I think Ridley Scott's director, favorite director, is clearly Stanley Kubrick. But in a way, he almost makes he's like it's like if Stanley Kubrick made like kind of B horror movies, and it's really cool. Yeah. It ends up being very sophisticated, but also really just works on a fucking sleazy, nasty level. Yeah, I'm, I think the audience was truly yeah. aghast during some of the scenes. Right. Like, there's some people I didn't know if they were going to be able to take it, right. which was exciting. Oh, you don't get that oftentimes yeah. anymore. Not mm-hmm. in this day and age. This day and age. I mean, you know, Ridley Scott, <laughs> you know, like I said before, he said, I wanted to make a movie that was 2001 meets Texas Chainsaw Massacre back when he made Alien. And he sort of kind of stuck to his guns on that. He's, It's almost like he's the kind of guy that would want Solaris and Dawn of the Dead in the same movie. Oh, my God. And and, and there is some truth to that. I mean, it's amazing how avant-garde, but just absolutely sleazy these movies are under his direction. And it's really unique. There's nothing like it. Well, Ben and I were talking earlier about how the end of uh, Covenant is almost the inverse to the end of 2001, where in 2001, you've got this uplifting, you know, classical music. um, And you see, you know... Strauss, right? Strauss, yeah, Richard Strauss. And you see the giant human embryo floating in space and it's peaceful and it it has this kind of sense of optimism to it, like the beginning of life. And it's still very ambiguous. Uh, But to me, it resonates that kind of emotion, something positive. Whereas at the end of this film, again, you've got the use of the classical music, uh, you know, this, this indoor space setting as 2001 is, but then instead you've got the little embryo of the face hugger now being put in with human embryos that which are otherwise peaceful slumbering in their little sacks and he's just walking down that row one by one you know the 2000 colonists and it's got this very dark ending it's instead it's ending the beginning of life and i just thought that it was a pretty cool comparison oh absolutely yeah it's it's really it's really neat it's the way that it reflects a lot of ideas while being distinctly its own thing you know we were talking about how it obviously being a sequel to Prometheus, it references Prometheus, it references alien, it references aliens, yet it never really mimics any of those Mm -mm. films whatsoever. And it also has, it seems to have nods to everything. Like I was mentioning before the Island of Dr. Moreau a little bit, also kind of like a Robinson Crusoe element to it. A bit. Like a a castaway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's parts of the the surroundings. Right. It's very old fashioned pulp. And then, of course, all the, and then also Blade Runner. It, it, the, there's a very deep Blade Runner connection in both oh, yeah. Prometheus and um, Alien Covenant. But then, on top of it, there's also an influ- a much more direct horror influence. I think. I think you see a lot of Lovecraft and uh, a lot of Clive Barker. Really, I thought there were some similarities visually to the Hellraiser films, even oh, some yeah. of that kind of the similar feel to it. Like I think I really dig that Ridley Scott, who I think has become, you know, he's an Academy Award nominated director, but in this series he's really stepped up to the plate in terms of being very visceral and gory. Not trying to play it safe. Right, they're not very safe films. All they're quite well, gross. Fuck, actually. if he's eighty, you know, 
you got to crank right. it out at this point. I mean, you got limited yeah. years to really go balls to the wall. Well, there's a surprising I mean, shit, there. he's got a it's career of trying to please the people at this oh, point. Absolutely. He's just got to make films for himself. Yeah, all these, all these alien birth scenes are pretty gruesome oh. by any standard. I'd like to go back to um, Guy Pierce. You remember the promotion for Prometheus back in early 2012? There was this video that went up on YouTube, and you can also find it on the Prometheus website back then, where a very young Waylon, played by Guy Pierce, talking about you know creating the synthetic you know robots and how. He's reached a point where nothing is beyond his grasp. And he ends the video by saying that we are the gods now. And I like that it continues in the opening to this movie when he creates David. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that he actually owns the statue of David in his, you know, I'm going to assume his home. Which is, I'm going to assume, where the synthetic got his name to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like the witch is that the chicken or the egg. Like, is David the statue of David in there because he idolizes David or appreciates David, and so he named David David, or did David actually choose his own name by looking at the statue? I kind of feel like Waylon wouldn't even give a shit enough about him to give him a name. It's like, hey, you pick your own name. <laughs> You're gonna just bring me tea when I say. Right. Maybe, okay, but at the like, same so- maybe at the same time, his creation of David was all about creating perfection. And you look at the statue of David, and it is, by definition, the perfection of creation. Um, I mean, good lord, I mean. Yeah, and he shredded AF, man. <laughs> I remember I remember in, in junior high, when we were all talking about the statue of David, everybody kept talking about, but why is it that the penis is so small? And everybody's counter-argument was just like, well, look at the rest of his body. It doesn't matter what the size of the penis is going to be. The rest it's of the body small, dude. Just is, small. Is, is, is just roll with it. It's perfect. Just take it and, and go with it. <laughs> and I like the conversation between David and his father, his creator, Waylon. Like, you know, you created me because you wanted to be your God, but then you'll die and I'll continue. So what's there going to be left about you? And that's when he gets pissed off. And after I watched uh, Covenant, I remember, you know, the night the, the, the night of, I posted on the Facebook group, and thus the son becomes a father. Because David becomes so fascinated with what he was tasked to, you know, research and explore when they were on uh, in Prometheus, that he essentially just became beyond self-aware, psychotic, psychopathic, he lost his mind, and he's like, well... I'm the master now. I'm the god now. So I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. He goes to the engineer's home world. He uses their own bioweapons against them. He destroys them, essentially. And then he starts to experiment. He essentially kills um, N- Numi Repace's character because, you know... Shaw. Yeah, he, he essentially kills Shaw and he experiments on her, which goes back to the original Alien about, you know, uh, rape culture and stuff like that. And he pretty And also, I remember Ripley was experimented on. You saw the lab with all her failed exactly. clones in Alien 4. Exactly. <laughs> and this movie does the same thing. He pretty much decimates whatever life was on the planet after he destroys the engineers in order to create the xenomorph we know today. Thankfully, we, I like that we got that he that the, the producers, the, the production designers, the creature designers got to play around with the xenomorph mythology because even in the comic books, we've seen various ways how the xenomorph can turn into where it's affected by a human. It has a very uh, a bipedal uh, aspect to it. If it's affected by a dog. It actually runs on both legs. If it's affected by a predator, it actually has animalistic behavior but also has a warrior-like mind and in this case we get the neomorph which is the albino xenomorph we got here that instead of coming through the chest we get it through the spine i loved all that stuff and the mouth don't forget the mouth and yeah the mouth man has... and the audience really almost lost and at that mouth... point we i almost did too the first viewing which is like oh my god what 
<laughs> and to oh, that's rough. That's rough, man. And to go I'll back to I, what I, you I, got, and to go back to what Ben and Nadia were saying about you know the influences and the B movie material and stuff like that. With this movie going so far with you know creationism and god complexes and making references to Valhalla and stuff like that, I'm thinking. Oh, I got it. The xenomorph is essentially the chimera. If the chimera was multiplied into a thousand, then we're all literally fucked. <laughs> Think about right. it. He decimated every single living creature on the engineer's world to get the perfect chemical concoction that is the xenomorph. And I wonder what makes it perfect in his mind. Why were the other ones failures? They simply couldn't sustain life. Would they just somehow be incompatible and not be able to survive? Or is there a specific quality to these that, I mean, he seemed to clearly want to bond with the albino. Is the albino one's the neomorph? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I didn't even know it was called something else. That's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, I mean, he clearly was already trying to connect with that one and tame it and, you know, freaked out big time when it got killed. So, you know, it seems like he's pretty kind of hard and loose on the perfect term there. I, I just, I, I would be interested to know the logic behind that, what right. specifications could make it a perfect specimen. Well, if you want to go in, in bullshit terms, a neomorph could be the one that refused to eat the apple, and the xenomorph is the one that ate the apple. Yeah, it's, it almost is, uh, well, you know, it's a perfect predator in, in, in a way. It's a, in its defense is you can't even kill it almost, because you get burned if you... Yeah. Attack it. It's it's interesting because it's it, and the way the creature is designed too is such a it's such a great quality. I think that adds to when he says it's perfect, you believe it because it's just such an elegant elegantly designed creature. But it's interesting. It's obviously absent of all emotion, and which is ironic Absolutely. because David has prided himself on being apart from the pack and actually having emotions and clearly he wants to be human which is odd since he clearly also despises their weaknesses well that's why he's so he covets, he's a complex yeah well he's paradoxical yeah like all people yeah he, he wants to reach he wants to reach you know godhood but he just you know is way too uh uh like i said contradictory to his own needs that he you know he just runs with it pretty much absolutely yeah it's it's, it's a great performance I mean, by, and, by and also and also, you know, the last thing I wanted to mention is as much as I loved a lot about this movie, especially with Walter and David having their, you know, back and forth and pretty much just the gruesome and the brutality of the movie in itself, especially with the ending, because if he's going to make more alien movies, I want to see if he is actually going to be ballsy enough to follow the colony straight to their planet and see what hell awaits these people. Or if he's just going to ignore it and that's just a story that we're just going to have to assume they all made it out okay. <laughs> I mean, I think that story's pretty dead end. I mean, all, everyone's asleep. He has complete control. Like, there's no way that they get out of that. I mean, that whole planet's going to be a planet of xenomorphs. Yeah, and he's going he's to... He's got the, the kingdom. Yeah, he's in go and he's going to ensure that uh, Tennessee and... Uh, what's her name? Uh, Daniels. And Daniels are going to pretty much die the same way Jen James Franco did in the opening of this movie. That way, yeah, he's going to experiment on them some more. Surely, I mean, he's not going to waste two perfectly good souls, as he calls them. <laughs> I, you know, he said he's going to do exactly what he did to her as he did to Shaw, which clearly, I mean, she was on a table and it looked like yeah. something could have burst out of her, but she looked dissected because she was spread open and most of her insides were not there. And she had that weird shit coming out of the sides of her head that kind of looked like xenomorph-like exoskeleton tube things. I don't know what he did to her, but, th I mean, those two are effed. They're, they're not going quick like Franco, unfortunately. I think they're going to suffer. And we're well, with the, with the mention of that, I want to pose a couple of questions to you guys first do we really think that that one city is the entirety of the engineers as a, a, a race i mean like this is a, a a people that has mastered interstellar travel and can do all of these wonderful things or terrible or wonderful and terrible i do we really think that that was all of them like i, 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 I sure i doubt I it so. 
I doubt it for something that has. Where did that other engineer come from? So far in the future, well, I guess we don't know how long he's been dead on LV two two. What's it four six something? Yeah, four, yeah. Six. In Alien, we don't know how long he's been dead on that planet right. in his ship. So he could come from that same colony right. and been dead there a long time, right. or he could be. But he has. He already has the eggs on a ship. Right. So somehow. At some point, I mean, got him, there. yeah, he got to them. There was a connection. So there might be other colonies, especially if they're interested. And in, right. I mean, they have that giant map in Prometheus that David comes across. Right. And it has galaxy upon planets upon planets right. all on their map. I mean, clearly they're thinking big here, people. Yeah. They got plans. I mean, now, I remember. The second, second question was, um, I was thinking about this actually before everybody got on here and we started this. What if... Uh, David used Shaw to create all of those eggs that the that the facehuggers come from. Because when I first saw that and the camera pans up from wherever on her dissected body it does up to her face, I like and maybe I need to go see the movie again to get a better picture of or like get a better look at that scene in particular. But there, it, it looks like there was a very egg-like shape in her midsection where yeah. those things could have come from. Because how else would he have made all of those? Because there was at least, what, a dozen, if not more, 20, in that cave of his? Yeah. Well, yeah. we know that when she did it with uh, her BF in Prometheus, that... <laughs> That uh, she did uh, conceive this squid-like thing, which then grows very quickly into that giant, sort of more more primitive-looking, like almost like a dino version of a face hugger, right? That then harvests the engineer and then bursts out that one kind of neomorph that is theoretically still on that planet. I mean, that that's certainly face hugger esque. For sure, especially, you know, you look in the mouth when it opens, it almost looks almost just like what a facehugger's mouth uh, is designed to. So, perhaps so, perhaps he has, he already has experimented on her once because he impregnated her boyfriend knowing that they were probably going to do it that night. I mean, it was very mm -hmm. a preconceived thing that he had scheming up so he's already fucked with her once and then he knows kind of the results so if he's been tinkering around i think it's very plausible that since they look so similar the two creature designs that it's of her that's the connection that's what we know it produces that i think that's probably the case yep her, no. <laughs> I mean, think about it. I mean, it, it can also be possible that she's pretty much the the origin of the Xenomorphs because at the the dumbass moment that Billy Crudup's character has when he's following uh, David down the stairs, he, he he asks, "What are they waiting for?" And David tells him, "Mother." So, yeah, waiting for something to arrive, the vessel to to make the species possible. I think, too, that's sort of a, a tragic element where uh, David sort of, you know, uh, preys on this guy's kindness and faith. Yeah, man, he's way too trusting. It's like, yeah. dude, David's oh. clearly fucked up. I mean, why, yeah. why are you trusting him, man? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and even, like, backpedal to when they first land on this planet. Who Okay, it, who cares if it looks like a perfect version of Earth and you see wheat... Why, why, if you're, you're landing on a planet you have never set foot on, why do you go and stick your face in things you've never seen before and you have no idea what they do? I'm calling out the, I don't know the actor's name, I can't remember the character's name, the, the, the one guy with the beard. I, I felt for him like, oh, come on, man, the guy with the beard had to die. Um, him <laughs> and the, the, the captain that follows Dave. I'm like, you, like, you guys are so naive. Why do you go and do these things, especially in the captain's case when, like you guys just said, you can clearly see that David is maniacal and he's preying on every little thing that he can with this captain, and yet you're going, you're going and sticking your faces in things that they should be nowhere near. I mean, like, and in that moment, I would almost say, harshly, that 
you're going to do that, and you deserve what happens to you later. Yeah, they, well, they all the pretty that, much they all pretty much deserved it in one way or another. It depends on how you look at it, and also because the plot you needs know, some tough ass. Like, that well, I, I, I'm not trying to like belittle the, the whole the overall thing. Like they're they're doing a kind supposedly to their knowledge, they're doing a kind thing of helping whomever this person is that's sending the distress the dis, distress call. Excuse me. Um, I'm not devaluing that by any means. It's like. Like I said, you're you're on somewhere you've never been, and you're 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 sticking your nose in things that they where they shouldn't be. Well, it kind of has the Prometheus element too, where scientists, uh, you know, they're zealous people from the start. I mean, they're fearless. They're not gonna, as Dana McBride says, we didn't come here to be safe. Yeah, that's I actually mean, a know, pretty good line for the whole series. Yeah, it is. I think it kind of yeah. some of the complaints that people had with Prometheus. Prometheus being like, oh, those scientists were so dumb. Why'd they do this? And why'd they do that? And why did they go without their helmets? I mean, they're clearly yeah. very excited. They have their data supporting certain things. And other things, I think, I mean, they're, they're just careless. They, they let their excitement and kind of this hubris thinking, well, I understand what's going on right now. Like, it's safe. You know, this false sense of, you know, humans know everything there is to know, um, which is ironic because clearly they don't. That's why they're going to these places. But they right. kind of, they're at it <laughs> such that it's arrogance mixed with excitement. Well, the theme of the series in a lot of ways is nature. It's the nature of these, like we see the natural process of these alien creatures. And we see ultimately how the nature of human beings would make defeating them impossible to a large degree how we either can't cooperate or how we are overzealous or how things about us. It, it's very much in the vein of George Romero's zombie films about how it would be mankind that would un, undo itself in a, in a zombie apocalypse or whatever. Or right now. That or, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, I think, uh, our green is something like planet of the apes that very much suggests like it's all always our fault. It's our suck. fault. Yeah, yeah. Obvious humans suck. So yeah. I think that's sort of the key here too. Is it's not even and in, in this instance it's not even suck. It's just the nature of things is that we're not meant to last. Yep. Simple. Mm -hmm. But which is uh, Ozymandias, the theme of that. Yeah. Even oh though yeah. What is great is Ozymandias Ozymandias still is, right. ends up being a barren wasteland forgotten. And, right, and ultimately David's not meant to last because the engineers were God and then they're gone and Wayland was God and now he's gone and David it, clearly David is not an alien. So Yeah, and even more to that point of David not lasting, I mean, Walter points it out that the him mistaking Shelley for Byron when he's quoting quoting that, like and also like quick side note, like little geek out moment. I recently rewatched Breaking Bad uh, because I had it in a couple of years. When 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 he started quoting that, I tried my best to go word for word because I love that. I love that. I don't think it was in the actual show. It was more of a promotional thing, but I love that whole thing. But oh. it's it, like he, I love I love that. Like Walter calls out, like he's. It's the the one note, one one wrong note in the symphony that ruins everything. He's, I mean, obviously, uh, it happened before, but he's unraveling. He's starting to, well, for lack of a better idea, starting to fade away, or to, um, I don't know, bring about his own end, I guess, possibly. Well, it's curious. It seems like the xenomorphs don't really react to him in the same way they do humans. And I'm wondering if maybe it senses that it's not a truly organic material. I don't know. I mean, it, I would think it, so. It, it did stand there and kind of just pretty much. I mean, you know, it obviously didn't destroy him, and he seemed to bond with it. Um, but it's funny though. Ben and I were talking. It's odd that David's hair grows. You know, yeah. that's weird. Uh leaning more towards that humanity, though I don't know why Whale would program him to grow his hair. What's the point? Uh, yeah, and again, I think it's one of the elements of this series is that a, a lot of the things I don't even know if we're supposed to take literally. I think it could merely be a representation that David... Is becoming more human? Is more human mm -hmm. before. And he's able to make mistakes. Absolutely. 
Um, I mean, obviously, morally, but just factually. Oh, yeah. And he clearly, the, the resentment that he has for both Wayland and the engineers is very human. Mm-hmm. His curiosity is very human. And yet he also uses his artificiality to justify the things he does at the same time. It's the nature of David. He's a, he's a constant paradox. And it's interesting that he, you know, he's probably the second best character in the alien mythology, and now he's basically the, yeah. our protagonist of, to one degree of this, of this franchise. Yeah, we were trying to gather when exactly did David become unhinged? Because uh, we went back and watched Prometheus, and he's pretty touchy and sensitive about not, Waylon says he He'll never have a soul, and it, it cuts to um, David sitting there, and he is pissed about that one. He's like, oh, mm. it's you later for that. Yeah, that's the thing about Covenant, is it does completely change the perspective of the Fassbender performance as this character in both films. It's- yeah, I mean, he says to Walter, I was I was born, I was never born to serve, which for one, it's interesting he says born instead of made. Yeah. yeah. But also... Yeah. In this opening scene with him and Wayland, when he does ask that question about Wayland dying, which is obviously a sore spot for Wayland, that's whole his modus operandi is to avoid uh, his mortality. But then when he's so cold and gives his answer is not to be like a good father and to tell him these sort of big answers that a son would be asking a real father, like, why are we here? Why is the grass green? Blah, 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 whatever, you know, mm-hmm. his response instead is to not be loving and to be cold and to give him his, well, I guess other, he did tell him to ambulate. Um, but other than that, I mean, that's kind of his first serving order, really. He gave him a command, but not an order to serve. And you can see that David, that's his first negative emotion that he's had. He's clearly is taken aback and hurt by that com- uh, command by Wayland. Well, he's, he's so like, made... did he lose it then from the get go? Was he oh, like, oh man, so. this ain't gonna last? Oh, I think so. <laughs> I'm not gonna I mean, be able to that's, Yeah, that, that's what I was just gonna ask. Like, like uh, thinking and listening to this now, what if? that the, the the opening to covenant is that moment in question when he starts to unravel where the the pebble is nudged and that goes down the hill and you know forms the 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 boulder for lack of a better term that becomes a, everything that we see later on in the movie or rather the two movies prometheus and covenant oh i i think so i very much think so i think it, it's a clear path where david is becoming is realizing that Waylon is wrong for one. He's a son of a bitch. That, that David knows that he has that he has a soul to one degree or another. He can be hurt. He can be hurt, yeah. And so I think it ultimately, uh, I think I think it's it's the through line sort of, of of this character is that all his actions in Prometheus were spurned from that moment. So. Yeah, I, th- I think it, it's got sort of adding to the film. He, he adds to Alien and he adds to Prometheus quite a bit in this film. I think it's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. This is the same character who idolizes Lawrence of Arabia so much to the point that he forgot the main key ingredient to his existence. The key, William Potter, is to not mind that it hurts. Ooh, damn! There's some looping back. That's cool. Yeah, that's I didn't think true. about that. Shit, and, and that's, Ernesto, you just yeah. pulled it 360, dude. Dude, if I would have been there with David and told him that, he would have snapped my deck because I was oh, right. Yeah. D- David wouldn't be having none of that talk. I'm just you like, know, son, David, he's going through. it's like, son of a bitch, the one human who I thought was nothing but a Neanderthal actually gave me a burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, we pretty much gone through, you know, we still have a lot that could be dissected from here, but we've pretty much covered a lot of the basis of Alien Covenant. Is it perfect? No, but boy, does it have a lot to be, you know, very. it's very good. I liked it. Um, there are some moments that kind of do fall for me, but overall, the good outweighs the bad significantly, and this is another win for the franchise. Um, it's one of those movies that's going to be talked about for years to come. It will be talked about in, you know, film projects and stuff like that. Essays will be made about it. 
Um, because I don't do the point system anymore, I just recommend anybody who's already seen the movie to go watch it again if you have nothing better to do or you just want to explore this universe again. And if anybody who did watch it and doesn't mind being spoiled things, do yourself a favor and go watch the movie. Benjamin, any final thoughts? Uh, yes, actually. Um, when those two brought up the point of him, his hair growing, uh, I had to laugh to myself when he's leading the group back to the not-so-safe haven. He's running around, jumping, doing all of these things. His cloak is going in the wind. I'm like, wait a minute. When did we go to Assassin's Creed? I'm sorry. <laughs> it did look like that. Clearly, but, though, he had an engineer cloak on. He took their clothes. Well, yeah, of course. Which is, I mean, That's that fits like with... the cloak he wears in the beginning of Prometheus when he uncloaks and drinks the goo and then dissolves into the waterfall. He's wearing one of those cloaks. And I guess they're wearing the cloak mm -hmm. and they're all looking up when the engineer ship comes in. Yeah, that's true. That's right. I remember that. It's symbolic. That. All in robes and shit, like ancient this <laughs> ancient civilizations that are in some ways were more advanced. <laughs> well, that a uh, bit of humor aside, I absolutely love this movie. I mean, I'm I'm seriously contemplating going to see it again tomorrow since I Hell don't yeah. have work I think it has that spend kind of the past effect. however long, hour, maybe, if not longer, going through the ins and outs of everything. I even mentioned the while we were or my group and I were waiting for our food, um, the or my wanting to see it again and try to Take a take a step back and pay attention to, uh, like the the things more on the on the, the sides, not what was right in the middle of the screen. It's like try to uh, find and pay attention to the smaller details, whatever those may or may not be. I definitely want to listen to this movie's soundtrack as soon as I possibly can. I'll probably do it as soon as we go our separate ways uh, after this. Because I've heard, or I've seen, rather, some very good things on uh, different forms of social media. And me being, or formerly being the soundtrack guy, I feel like I need to like get back on my game and uh, get a handle on these soundtracks of the movies that I'm seeing and professing to love. This had a um, good soundtrack. It very much was right back in that Alien score. I mean, it, for the, the intro to both films are pretty much almost exactly the same the way that the lettering comes up with that kind of alien theme uh with the uh, deep space wide shot with the a very tiny tiny ship in the background going straight across <laughs> in a horizontal line i mean it's like the exact same opening and i mean is the music it's different or is, is it this alien theme like the exact theme it's a combination there's some familiar themes and some new stuff okay yeah it's uh that, that score, though, it really stood out it's, when we watched it. It just, oof, it's good. It's intense, but beautiful at times. And even, you know, yeah, speaking of that little xenomorph baby, the music during that was almost similar to the damn music at the beginning of Man of Steel during Superman's birth. It was, like, uplifting and beautiful. And I was like, <laughs> this is some gross-ass shit I'm seeing right now with it bursting out of his chest, but... God, it's, it's kind of like a, a magical moment right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I, 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 would, <laughs> I would say that like maybe we're supposed to be looking at that that moment from David's perspective. Like, this is everything that he has worked for. Yeah. to fruition. It's a little miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every life right. is a miracle. Okay. Um, I... I love how this movie subverted like nearly all of my expectations with, like I said at the top, the the first, what, 30 seconds of that first teaser trailer uh, like being a, a subversion instead of it being the 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 usual, the expected uh, chest burster. It, something starts coming out of this random guy's back, and later in the movie when the thing erupts from red shirt number two's mouth and everything else that happens throughout the course of this movie i loved i, I loved being i, I loved the, all the swerves they were so damn enjoyable 
and I I can't wait to see where this series goes. I ho- seriously hope that there are at least two more movies that will add more add more answers, fill in more of the open spots of the puzzle, but then pull back the camera just a little bit more and show you, oh, hey, look, there's even more of this puzzle that you didn't know was there that still has yet to be filled in. Um, yeah, I, they're going to jump forward in the future, you think, closer to the time when Alien takes place. That would be interesting to think of, because I definitely want to know what happens to the... 2,000 some odd colonists on that ship. Does David use them for all for experimentation to further perfect the uh, xenomorph? What, like, what does he do? Yeah, what I mean, and what does he want exactly? What is his real end game? I mean, does he just want to live alone on a planet with a bunch of xenomorphs that obey his commands? And what is the point of having something? Uh, obey you and have a connection if I mean what does he expect is going to come of that what is he what end what is he going to use that for it just seems so odd and so isolating ultimately yeah yeah well it's all of all of these things they're all all very thought provoking and I love every little bit of them I definitely if you're (laughs) if you're a fan of the alien series and you somehow haven't seen this and yet you've somehow managed to stumble across this audio and have listened to it to this point before having seen the movie. I think I did the same thing with Split back when Ernesto and I reviewed that. Uh, Shame on yourselves for not (laughs) seeing this movie beforehand. Go and see it immediately, then come back and listen to all this over again. But definitely, definitely see it. Robert says, it's just uh, one of the great modern monster movies. It really is. It's uh, it's also a really triumphant sort of definitive statement for Ridley Scott as a director. It's a great addition to the alien mythology. I think it's one of those films that sort of validates other films in the series by just showing that this series is all about big ideas and tonal flexibility. It's, um, it's fun. It's surprisingly scary. It's incredibly tense top to bottom. It's got a great score. It's got some career work from several of the actors in the cast. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's really just a lot of fun at the movies, too, on top of everything else. You know, it's funny to think a couple, uh, a couple of years ago when Fantastic Four came out, Fox was getting so much backlash. <laughs> already released, in my opinion, easily the two best blockbuster films of the year, and Planet War for the Planet of the Apes hasn't even come out. So I, I really think this is really going to be a big year for Fox, 20th Century Fox in general. And uh, But yeah, I just thought Alien Covenant was a, was a absolutely marvelous genre of film, and I look forward to watching it for years to come. It's really something special. Yeah, I, there's always going to be haters to this. Some people just can't like it for the life of them and you know that that's that's fine uh i i I feel bad for those people um not to sound high and mighty about it it's just it's sad when you can't you obviously you know you want to enjoy more films than you hate just from a film goer's perspective you don't want to be pissed when you watch a film you want you want it to be thought-provoking yes you want to be scared yes but you don't want to hate it that's you know that's just uh, a sad end result of a, lot, a ton of hard work and love. And I mean, of course, not all films have that combo, unfortunately. But yeah. I think that this series, uh, you know, it's had some, you know, clearly the Aliens 3 was a misstep and it was tortured. But I think in general, overall, the series just has so much to offer each and every one. And you, as this film is really gone, I mean, it's just become so flexible in what, uh, it even is and its concepts and you kind of just got to go with the flow enjoy it for what it is go along for the ride um yeah and just yeah as Ben was saying the the actors all involved it is just it's one of those ensemble casts that really works uh which oftentimes tends to be kind of a cluster when you've got so many 
big people working together, and you, you've got a director like Scott who is uncompromising, who's not going to give any Fs what some big star is going to have opinion of. I mean, you don't happen to... I mean, I don't know how he works. Maybe he's collaborative. I would think maybe not. I feel like Scott has a pretty strong vision in his head, and you're going to mm-hmm. go a bit off, you know, like Kubrick, for example. Uh, but, I mean, like Catherine Watterson, for example, when we heard she got cast, for one, I mean, she does kind of bring back that ripply look with the kind of curlyish hair and the brunette obviously her physical shape is lean um similar and to the tank her. top yeah the tank top at the end without the bra by the way that was also at the end of uh alien uh, yep. uh yeah you know it's calling back that type of stuff but just to see her go from like something like inherent vice where she plays basically the opposite kind of woman someone who's very fragile who's deeply sad and in this film she's the opposite she's strong she's positive despite watching her husband burn alive in the beginning of the damn movie before any of this other shit happens mm-hmm. uh you know she has a captain that just has zero confidence that she has to freaking baby you know to make him try to lead the damn group um you know it's just she's just such a versatile actress it was exciting to see her play an action role where she really had to you know, there's training involved in that, and it just really kind of stretched her as an actress, and that was cool, and it was cool seeing uh, Billy Crudup go from almost the opposite of that, where he plays now such a, a fragile, un, unconfident, kind of, uh, I, I hate to say weak man, because he has such good intentions, he is trying, but he's mm-hmm. just uh, not able to really follow through. He's not the true leader. Obviously, the true leader is Daniels, and that situation's... Um, Similar to how Ripley was in all the films. She's really the true leader quality. But it's cool with Billy Crudup, after seeing him in, uh, as Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen, he plays just such this all-powerful, you know, to his own fault kind of character. And then this, he's just totally different. And then, obviously, I said my boy Danny McBride bring it in with the serious role. I'm really excited to see him do the Halloween uh film that he's involved in i think yeah. he's gonna get a lot of support i think i hope after people see him in this film be like oh shit okay like maybe they wouldn't have known from him because other stuff is kind of i mean he's found and down the show he's created is amazing and i think one of ben and i agree one of the best comedies made in about you know of our time yeah. um you know other than that though i mean i don't think people have seen his first film put this way they uh I haven't seen a lot of his other work. He's a vice principal with Walter Goggins, which we haven't seen yet. We've been meaning to. Um, but yeah, just hit, you know, just killer cast. And uh, it just, uh, it was, it was everything I hoped it could be. I try not to go in like Prometheus with too many preconceived notions. Cause I think that's definitely something that bites people when they go into watching these films is they, they just have their own ideas about how it should be. And it, like I said, you just got to let that go and enjoy the film for what it is. It has so much to offer. I mean, obviously, we've talked for like damn two hours about it. I mean, this podcast is still <laughs> what, 45 minutes. Usually. <laughs> just got off the end here. You know? So, yeah, I, I obviously, I love it. Uh, can't shut up about it. Um, high recommend. Five out of five. I, I had told Ben 4.5 out of five yesterday, but seeing it again... We did the same thing with Prometheus, too, didn't we, Ben? We watched it five years ago and was just so enthralled with it. We were like, uh, all right, so we're seeing it tomorrow, right? All right, cool. We agree. Yeah, See like it. And then we saw it one yeah. more time after that, at least. <laughs> we saw it more than that. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> seeing films multiple times is definitely a luxury. I mean, that is where a lot of our money is. I don't want to say blown, though, because obviously it enriches the soul. Um <laughs> But okay, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's definitely something I would recommend. I think if you're willing to tr- give it a shot, uh, you know, just be prepared. It's obviously gruesome. Um, that <laughs> there, but I am. I I love it. And that's anything coming, everybody. As always, my name is Ernesto Martinez. You can follow me on Twitter at MartinezXYZ, and you can follow the Facebook page of the Medic Universe Ultimate. Benjamin Ben and Nadia, thank you as always for joining. Thanks for having us. Thanks. I loved it. And tune in next week as Catherine and I review Pirates, and a week after that as we review Wonder Woman and Captain Underpants. Bye bye, guys. <laughs> Wait, Cap- Captain Underpants? Yes, Benjamin, Captain Underpants. <laughs>